Be, Don Corleone. I need a man who has powerful friends. I need a million dollars in cash. I need Don Corleone, those politicians that you carry in your pocket, like so many nickels and dimes. What is the interest for my family? 30%. In the first year, your end should be three, four million dollars. And then it would go up. Now, what is the interest for the Tatali family? My compliments. I'll take care of the Tatalias. Out of my share. So, I receive 30% for finance, political influence, and legal protection. That's what you're telling me. That's right. Why do you come to me? Why do I deserve this generosity? If you consider a million dollars in cash, just finance, to salute, I'm calling you. I said that I would see you because I heard that you were a serious man to be treated with respect. But uh, I must say no to you, and I'll give you my reasons. It's true, I have a lot of friends in politics. But they wouldn't be friendly very long if they knew my business was drugs instead of gambling, which they regard as a, a harmless vice. But drugs is a dirty business. Oh, don't it, make, it doesn't make any difference to me what a man does for a living, I understand. But uh, your business is... Uh, a little dangerous. If you will. Let's, I promised we'd move around, so we're going to go down to Tampa now and talk about a dope dealer, a uh, Florida mobster named Ignacio Intonori. Great name. He, uh, there isn't a lot known about his early life. He was an Italian immigrant. That's about it. He shows up during the Prohibition. He becomes big in Prohibition. When that ends, in the 1930s, he turns to narcotics, and he was really good at it, selling dope. He had a pipeline set up for, say, France, and he used that connection to move it into Cuba. He had big, big connections in the Cuban government. He smuggled the dope through Cuba and then into Tampa. And then, according to the Narcotics Bureau, who were very good at what they did, they had him pegged to send a dope over to St. Louis to a hood there named Tommy Buffa, and then to Kansas City to Nicola Impastato, James D. Simone, and Joe DeLuca. Before we, and they distributed it out in the Midwest, California. Let me stop for a moment to tell you something. Years ago, I knew, I interviewed a wonderful lady. Uh, gosh, she was old then. Her family lived in Cuba when she was a teenager. She's an American, and her family built buildings and managed properties and so forth. And their business, part of it was down there. But she grew up there. And what she was telling me is it was a great life. But the bosses down there, the government guys, first they took cash. Then they had enough cash, and they said, well, give me some payment and dope. Well, that, that's all they needed because, you know, there's no such thing as a little bit of cocaine and a little bit of heroin. So by the time Castro shows up, 57, 58, 59, they're all doped up. Nobody's got the motivation to fight. They just figure, let's, I don't know, let the soldiers fight. There's nobody leading the soldiers, nobody leading the government. These guys are all coked up, they're doped up, they're moving back and forth to Florida. They don't really care. And that accounts for what really happened in the fall of Cuba, you know. I mean, Castro was a little guerrilla group in the hills. Uh, anyway. Let's move along. So Antonori starts to come to the attention of the narcotics people, and he's scaring the bosses across the U.S. Don't forget, like, I'll give you an example, uh, Big Jim Calissimo in Chicago. When Johnny Torrio, his underling, came and said, look, we got to get involved with this prohibition thing, he said, no. Calissimo said, no, 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 no. It's the federal government's going to come in, stay out of it. And so they killed him, and they got into it anyway. But it typified the the attitude of these early Italians, like, you know, don't fool, keep it local. The federal government, they're just, a, they got a machine there. You know, they run a court system, they put you in jail, they run the prisons, stay away from it. But 
by then, Santos Trefficanti Sr., who had kind of been under Antonori a little bit, he starts feeling his muscle and he's pushing Antonori out. So what happens? I, I don't know. October 22, 1941. One story is Antonori started selling bad dope to Chicago or he took their money, didn't deliver the dope. I don't know if that's true. It's like the Godfather said, you know, your business a little dangerous. Dope was dangerous, you know. Look at Joe Valachi, you know, came out of the. He was a pretty straight gangster for decades. He started with the mobs, but then he got into dope. They caught him. He had no choice. He's going to prison for life. It was a, a dangerous business. So in October 22, 1940, somebody walked up behind Antonieri and his girlfriend. They were sitting in a bar and shot through the window, blew off the back of his head, and that was that. 1953, his son, Joe, who uh, was also a drug dealer, was, first they tried, he was wounded. Somebody walked up and pumped a shotgun blast through the windshield of his truck. He survived. But on November 4, 1953, he's in a Boston bar in Yorba City. Uh, it's owned by a hood named Johnny Rivera. Johnny Scarface Rivera. How's that for a name? Another customer, they don't know, walks in, he casually orders a rye without uh, ice, swallows it, one gulp, reaches into his pocket, takes out a pistol, a revolver, points it at Antonori's head, shoots him dead. It's a very, very dangerous business you're in, my friend.